Brzezinski from Washington. Now I've been, I've been told to make the introductions uh, short, so I'll keep them short. You probably know both of them anyways, but uh, Ambassador Hunter was US ambassador to NATO under Clinton from 19, President Clinton from 1993 to 1998. He was also uh, served in the National Security Council as Director of West European Affairs from 1977 to 79. I should probably go in the other direction rather than going back. And But in the course of a distinguished career, he was twice recipient of the Department of Defense of, uh, from the Defense Department for Distinguished Public Service. Um, Ian Brzezinski, who is uh, also a member of Alianza, a board member of Alianza, who we all know, is in Washington. I point out a graduate of Williams, Williams College, 1986. He himself worked for Senator William Roth uh, as a legislative assistant and still served as a staff member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. He also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Europe and NATO Policy, 2001 to 2005. And today, most people know him due to his association uh, on the Atlantic Council and a senior uh, fellow at the uh, Brent Scowcroft Center, although dear Brent Scowcroft, I think, passed away a few years ago, a few months ago. Is that right? A couple years ago. Went very oh, strong. Yeah. Anyways, today's conversation is uh, high in the news because we just had a successful visit or visit of President Biden to, to Cornwall and then to Brussels and then to Geneva. And I wanted to start with a general question. Can we uh, give uh, the president a grade for his performance? What, what he set out to achieve and how well he performed in, in meeting those objectives. I'll start with the, the more elder uh, Robert. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I got more here than uh, my friend. Ian. But he's wiser, so he should go first. Well, I would give him an A minus. Uh, and what he needed to do, which was to demonstrate not just the words he had uh, at the beginning of the administration, that to use his expression, America's back. Uh, the last four years really were very difficult in American, European, including uh, US uh, NATO relations, where the last president even though I believe he was committed to the central proposition of Article 5, uh, if anybody's attacked, everybody comes in to the rescue, including the United States, but he never would say it out loud. Uh, Biden has had kind of an easy thing to do, which is to reaffirm certain kinds of things. And as the French president said, breath of fresh air. So it was one of those things, I guess it was uh, Woody Allen or somebody, 85% is just showing up. So Biden showed up. He said the right things. Uh, he endorsed a bunch of documents. In fact, it's about the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica if you take them all together. And I think uh, uh, Ian probably actually read it. He's, he and I are probably the only people who ever read the damn thing. Um, and he then built this process, starting with uh, the British in Cornwall and the G7 uh, with the so-called New Atlantic Charter and then the G7 agreement, uh, then moving on to London, meeting the Queen, uh, going to Brussels where he had the NATO summit and the poor stepchild, the European Union summit. And then he went off to see Mr. Putin in, uh, in Geneva in which he said, look, they got my back. Now, there's a lot of stuff in that uh, that a number of people might not have agreed with, but okay. So, so they uh, went along with it. Uh, so I would give him an A for optics. In terms of actually resolving issues, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the jury is still out because in all these documents and in, in all the uh, things that are involved, there's an awful lot of work to be done. And a lot of it's not particularly uh, straightforward. So, uh, so that's, that's what I'm going Well, to that's, I think that's an A minus is a, a very good grade. Ian, are you going to be... Uh... Well, you put it, you put, you're a little bit in a box here, but how about you, Ian, grade? I, I agree with Ambassador Hunter. I, I think Robert is, is, is spot on. And you know, maybe I come from a slightly different perspective. I'm, I'm kind of a Republican. But the fact is, is that the president did go over there at a time when you know, many Europeans were questioning our commitment to transatlantic security, to one of our most important alliances, the, the NATO alliance. Uh, and he did a lot to demonstrate, one, that America's back. America has an internationalist agenda. It sees its future tied to the future of, of, of the world. 
Uh, he rekindled relationships, important strategic relationship with, 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 with some of our key allies. Right. Uh, I think his best performance in terms of the overall delivery, not just in terms of optics, but optics and substance was probably the G7. Uh, and I think it got a little bit weaker uh, when he went down to the US-EU summit and the NATO summit. And since we're focusing on, on the NATO summit here today, I'm completely parallel with, with Ambassador Hunter. You know, he had a, a key objective of saying America's a back, rekindling relationship, reestablishing confidence in America's commitment to the core co uh, responsibility that comes with NATO membership. And that's the Article 5 security guarantee, one for all, all for one. That was key. We had a very strong articulation by not only President Biden, but because of President Biden from our European allies of the challenges before us. Uh, so first and foremost, you had a NATO summit uh, communique that had one of the longest articulations of Russian transgressions and aggression I, 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 I know of. I, I would be willing to bet a beer. That was the longest four or five paragraphs. You had literally detailing yeah. all the things that Russia has done from cyber warfare to election ma manipulation to outright uh, territorial aggrandizement, uh, invasion when it comes to Georgia and, and, and Ukraine powerful wards. Uh, perhaps even more demanding was to get to, to swing the Europeans in behind and come up with a very strong characterization of China's uh, challenges, uh, the challenges that it's creating as it becomes an increasingly powerful global actor. It even defined China as a systemic challenge. That was hard to pull the Europeans behind to do. The reason why I don't push it to an A, and maybe Robert agrees with this, is that while there was an articulation of the problem, at least in, the, in NATO and from the EU, you didn't really have an articulation of what the alliance was going to do about it. Yep. They heralded their past steps, which I would say have been in the right direction, but still remain insufficient. But they didn't really present a robust agenda of the actions that will be taken to counter uh, the challenges posed by Russia and the challenges posed by, by, by China. And picking up on what you say there about alliances, alliances seem to work effectively when they have a common, common objective, like they did at the beginning, and they perceive a common threat, a threat. In what ways today do we see that, a common, obje common objectives and a common threat? Or is there division there? We noted a little bit of division. Ian, I'll go back to you. Well, I mean, you, you had a clear articulation of China as a systemic challenge. Yeah. Uh, you had a clear reaffirmation of, uh, of Russia as a increasingly volatile, dangerous and aggressive state on, on, on NATO's frontier. And you know, in fairness to the Biden administration, you know, still within six months of its first term, it probably needs to focus first on getting consensus around the problem, yeah. on getting a common recognition and definition of the problem before all of a sudden lurching out and saying, here's what we're going to do about it. But I, but I am concerned that, uh, you know, we are having a big, what I would call an Obama redux when mm -hmm. it comes down to the exercise of American power and the need to be more assertive, if not risk-taking, when it comes down to pushing back and deterring aggression from powers like Russia and China. So for example, being a case in point, look at the West, and that is, includes the US response to the massive mobilization of Russian forces on Ukraine's frontier and in its occupied territories, territories occupied by, by, by Russia. You know, a concentration of a lot of offensive firepower, not a single muscle movement from the West, not a single US force moved. In fact, you could argue that the United States actually backed off because it reversed the course of two ships that were gonna transit into the Black Sea. Uh, you know, not even, a, no economic sanctions in response to this aggression, just some light words of political condemnation. That is a pattern that is consistent with our past policy towards Russia, and is a pattern is, is an approach that I think is actually emboldened Russia and increases the likelihood of further Russian aggression. Uh, uh, Robert, do you think will, will, will Biden go beyond that and exercise yeah. power, and yeah. in a way that 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 will actually shape shape and change Putin's calculus? Uh, Robert, do you think that the Biden administration has sent a clear enough message or we've tread too lightly here, let's say even in the last six or seven months since we have a new administration? Well, first, let me pick up on what Ian said about yeah. uh, this is Obama redux. I, I don't think that's such a bad thing, but 
we don't want to debate that. We're going to talk about the future. Uh, just pick on one particular thing, uh, which is Ukraine, in which this administration is picking up on the past in terms of making clear to Russia uh, that it has gone as far as will be tolerated, uh, not just by the United States, but by the West. Uh, the deployments uh, into uh, uh, Central Europe, uh, the, the various things that are happening. There's a, uh, a former Soviet air base uh, in uh, Romania uh, that is now being picked up by NATO with $152 million going into it to make that a central hub for the use of uh, air power. Uh, you have the continuation of, uh, of uh, military deployments by NATO uh, with the United States engaged in Central Europe as well. Uh, now, as for Russian mobilization on the frontier, sometimes signals like that are signs of weakness rather than strength. I recall during the uh, Kosovo War, at one point, the NATO mobilized its entire air fleet and flew it off to the Serbian border, stopped and came back. And that was supposed to be a signal to Milosevic, uh, the president of, uh, of uh, uh, Serbia, of strength. It was a sign of weakness uh, mm -hmm. because it didn't go anywhere. I'm mm -hmm. not saying what the, the Russians did with their mobilization was a sign of weakness, but they, they didn't invade. They weren't going to invade. And you say, well, uh, so what? Uh, we, incidentally, at the same time at NATO, was not really noticed, we're running a smaller exercise on the other side of the border. What I worried about was not so much uh, the Russians doing that and looking towards the meetings with, uh, uh, with uh, Biden, et cetera, that somebody might miscalculate. Uh, I think we are at a point now where in terms of, of uh, kinetic war, if you want to call that, as opposed to cyber, as opposed to oil uh, pressures, and, and as opposed to interference in Western elections and that kind of thing, solar wind on the cyber, uh, one of the, uh, the, the major cyber uh, interventions. Um, I think that we have more or less come to a point where the Russians understand that if they were to take a step kinetically across uh, what is now becoming an informal frontier, uh, that would bring all hell coming around over in their, uh, their heads. Why I think they're shifting over to hybrid uh, activities. So it didn't bother me that they were uh, running their, uh, uh, their troops in an exercise, provided people don't make a miscalculation. And that's one reason why uh, the arms control side is uh, so important. Why even with everything going on between the United States and Russia, uh, the New START agreement was going to lapse on the 5th of February. It was going to lapse, would disappear. But the two sides got together at the last minute and said, no, let's extend it for five more years. Yeah. They also talked when Biden saw Putin, okay, we have a disagreement about the uh, intermediate range uh, nuclear force agreement. Let's get some folks together and, and talk about what went wrong or what is going wrong, which includes Russian misbehavior. You're not going to have a group unless it does that. Uh, they also agreed to try to do more with the so-called Minsk II process, which is the effort to do something about, uh, about uh, Ukraine. They're going to try to get some people together to work on that because real changes don't take place at the summit. I got to tell you, I'm against summit meetings. It's a great casualty of, of the jet plane. <laughs> leaders don't, uh, since Yalta, uh, leaders haven't made big decisions. You know, they've, been, they, they've been putting the last piece in the uh, jigsaw puzzle. So uh, I agree entirely with Ian. We now have to work on the practicalities of what's going to happen in the future. Practicalities. Now, now Europeans, both, yeah, sorry, go on. No, the Europeans, almost to a country, I want to make sure that we deter Russia in everything that's important. But we also keep the door open to try to figure out some way in which we're going to live together. Because the fact of the matter, we're all going to have to live together in the future. The Russians know it, we know it.
We saw some slight fissures in, uh, in uh, the G7 with Macron saying, let's not tie China into this. This is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It, you know, we want to keep not to be biased or bring it, another element in there. Do you think it seems unusual uh, that NATO should be dealing with both these issues, even though China's half a world away? Either one of you step in there. Well, I'll just start and I'll go over again. Good. You read the 14,404 words of the NATO communique. I actually did. That was my homework assignment. Uh, yes, they talk about China being a challenge, et cetera, but it's pretty weak stuff in terms of doing something. Most Europeans don't want to get involved in this. Uh, they can understand you don't want the, the uh, Belt and Road Initiative to go too far. There's been some responsiveness on, on that and the like, but they don't want to see the fundamental focus of NATO in particular, shifting in that direction if they can help it. They want to make sure America will continue, as far as Europeans are concerned, rooted to European security, defense, and deterrence. After all, the reason the European allies after 9-11 went to Afghanistan was not because they were worried about uh, the Taliban were going to come to Western Europe, even though there was some terrorism, they were worried America was going to lose interest in Europe. Yeah. Very much so, because they know that the only country, only country that can deal effectively with Russia is the United States of America. So yeah, they gave Biden a little bit of stuff on China, but boy, oh boy, that conversation in, in the West has only just begun. Oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Ian, what's your take on that being a, a, a European roots, obvious European roots on the border? I think Ambassador Hunter has got it spot on. This is going to be probably the most important and most difficult discussion the United States has over the next year and a half with its European allies. As Robert pointed out, you know, the Europeans want to focus on their backyard. A number of their economies are very tied into the Chinese economy, and they don't want to jeopardize that. Uh, but, you know, I think we have to be absolutely clear, this is going to be the definitive issue on the transatlantic agenda and the most contentious one, particularly as the alliance tries to redefine its strategic concept. This is a baseline kind of strategy document the alliance operates off of, and it hasn't been updated in about a decade, maybe longer. Uh, and whether or not NATO will be engaged in the Indo-Pacific will be reflected in, the, in this document when it matures in the, what about six to, 10, to 12 months. My personal position is, that you really need to have NATO have a footprint in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and it, it's not gonna be a footprint that's gonna be quote unquote militarily decisive, but it has to be geopolitically decisive. That is demonstrating to the Chinese, to the Chinese government, I should say, that they cannot peel the United States and Europe apart, that we're in there together. Uh, and this is important for two reasons. One, uh, for, the United States and its allies would be more effective uh, in their strategy and the execution of strategy to check uh, Chinese aggression and to shape that relationship with China into a more constructive way if they're seen as fully engaged economically, politically, and militarily. I.e., if there's a firefight in the Pacific, the, the, the Chinese will have to be concerned that that will involve the Europeans and with that engagement will cost the full weight of European political and economic power. Second, I would argue, in order to preserve America's commitment, including its military presence in Europe, the Europeans need to be engaged in the Indo-Pacific. Because the worst thing that could happen to the alliance in this day and age would be, all of a sudden, a division of labor, in which the transatlantic community says, United States, you'll take care of China and Europe, since we got a $17 trillion economy, we'll take care of the $1.5 trillion uh, Russian economy and the threats that, that emerge from that. That is an argument that is circulating in Washington. I think it's a very dangerous one and it could lead to a decoupling. So the Europeans have an interest in being militarily engaged through NATO in the Indo-Pacific because it will lead to a more effective Western strategy, strategy of the community democracies to deal with the rise of China. And it's the most effective way to preserve America's commitment, uh, military commitment and presence in Europe. I would say that um, to some extent, many people in, let's say, the Lithuania or Latvia, or for that matter, uh, in uh, Poland, are a little nervous about America getting distracted, let's say, with safeguarding Taiwan. There's no Article 5 
calling American power to safeguard Taiwan. I mean, at what, how far can you keep these things apart? I mean, to some extent, China seemed to be the new big bad boy. Uh, it, it was the first time mentioned, I think, at a NATO meeting, except, except passingly in 2019. No one spoke about China, and now China was very much the boogeyman. Do you think we, do you think we rattle the Chinese unnecessarily? Uh, Bob, uh, Robert, what do you think? Well, first, let me go back to what Ian said. Or if he's going to call me Mr. Ambassador, he'd call him Mr. Secretary. So I, I like first name. I like first name. Uh, we finally disagree on something. NATO, as NATO, is not going to get engaged militarily in the Indo Pacific area. It's not going to happen. It's hard enough to get NATO to do things regarding North Africa, hard enough to get them to do things uh, in uh, the Middle East other than Afghanistan, as I talked about before little bit of, of Iraq, uh, except for one or two countries, Britain, because it wants to have a special relationship with uh, the United States. Uh, a major reason for this document called a New Atlantic Charter, which frankly, if it were going to be meaningful, it should have been with the entire uh, NATO crowd, uh, not just with one country, it was kind of a soft to uh, uh, to Boris Johnson to continue the process where the special relationship works more for us than for Britain. It's been a wonderful thing. We've, we, we've had a wonderful time with that for, for a long time. I used to manage these things and he and I guess did it his, it, his part. Where it matters is, and we don't want to call it a division of labor uh, and certainly not in the terms he was talking about, but the place where the Europeans need to be useful on China is on some diplomatic and a major thing economically so that the Chinese cannot split us off by offering goodies to the Europeans. Uh, it's a major reason why a fundamental aspect of President Biden's uh, national security strategy is the re-validation, the reconstruction of the American economy, uh, a recognition which is been around there for some time, but I hadn't been acted on, that you got to have a strong American economy, making things, able to uh, uh, pull together, able to have good jobs, as we use the expression here, uh, to get American companies to repatriate uh, money to the United States. Uh, one of the most important agreements uh, of the entire Biden trip was the agreement that had worked out in advance of trying to create a floor of 15% yeah. Uh, taxes on international corporations uh, so that American corporations won't continue to flood abroad. That's where the complementarity of dealing with China has to be. Not a NATO, that's just that's just not going to happen. And if one pretends it's going to happen, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, well, so you, gents, you gents disagree on one point there, but I'm going to pick up something that you just said, Robert, about um, what's in the interest of, of the United States? And I think it was Jake Sullivan who made a comment where he said our foreign policy is based on middle class Americans. Uh, middle class Americans, it seems to me, are very happy to have a strong, robust exchange, economic exchange continuing with China. Would that complicate matters? Well, it's been a problem for decades now uh, that we have, we, and I'm an American, American middle class consumer. Fat, dumb, and happy, and be able to get any cheaper things. You go to Home Depot or uh, or places like that, and you try to buy some. It's all made in China. Well, why shouldn't it be made in the United States? Why aren't there the incentives to people to bring the money home and make things here? Right. And I know the private sector is going to yell bloody murder on that, but there needs to be an awful lot more emphasis on making things in America, uh, so that the job benefits will go to Americans and not uh, to Chinese and, and some others and some others. For example, right now we're having a, a crunch in, uh, in uh, computer chips. Most yeah. of which are made in Taiwan, all right? Uh, so, but why shouldn't they be made more in the United States? So what I would like to see and which I have not seen yet, this goes beyond NATO, is a US-European relationship, which is holistic and which brings together all the instruments of power and influence, uh, not necessarily in one institution, but in complementary institutions. One of the things I've most worked on 
for the last more than quarter of a century is NATO European Union relations. Well, in the uh, NATO communique, there's kind of, oh, that's a nice thing to do. In the uh, EU US communique, which is about half the length, but still the longest ever, uh, that relationship gets two sentences right at the end. Somebody stuck it in at the end. That's ludicrous. Uh, we have to see these things holistically. We want to deal with China. NATO is going to do certain kinds of things. America will do certain kinds of things. The Brits on the military side. But then the Europeans working with us need to do things on the economic side and on the diplomatic side. And final point, one of the good things about the uh, uh, Biden meeting with Putin is the positive aspects of it. And there were a lot beginning to offer maybe a chance for the Russians not to cozy up so much to the Chinese that I am sure that Mr. Putin really in his heart of hearts would not like to be uh, the, uh, uh, the peanut butter and the sandwich between the United States and China. Yep. Ian, how about you? Uh, they, there's a few things jumping in on that, but I, uh, they're taking through your mind. So pick up on any, anything that Robert just said there. You know, the biggest challenge that, that the West right now ha in, has when it comes down to effectively su succeeding in, in the great power competition is the management of our economic relationship with countries like Russia and, and, and China. You know, to me, here we have Russia. It's occupying uh, territories of Ukraine, Georgia. It's conducting assassinations across Europe. It's violating the Chemical Weapons Treaty, in, in part through its assassinations uh, conducted, in, for example, in, in, in the UK. It's clamping down on its, on its um, the Putin administration is clamping down on, on dissenters in a way we haven't seen since the Cold War. You know, and the list goes on. Yet Germany and other Europeans are driving forward with Nord Stream 2. They continue to buy huge volumes of record volumes of Russian gas. Uh, you know, they're not exercising their economic advantages uh, as part of their strategy to kind of push Putin into the right, more constructive direction. And the United States is guilty of this too. I mean, I was stunned to read in Bloomberg a few weeks ago that we're buying like 500,000 barrels a day of Russian mazout. And here we're going over and beating up the Germans uh, for buying and building, you know, infrastructure for mm -hmm. Russian national gas. Uh, we have to change our corporate culture, our business culture, uh, so that it's better aligned with our actually strategic interests. And the same applies for China. Um, just in the other day, there was an article in the news in the Wall Street Journal that we're having record amounts of cap US capital flowing into China. The investment community is on a China high, even as you know, the Uyghurs are being decimated, if not subject to genocide. It's a clamp down in, 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 in Hong Kong. Chinese ships are plowing through the national waters of other countries, literally running over small fishing boats, uh, the Filipinos or, or the Vietnamese, you know, making assertions and acting on assertions that are complete violations of, um, you know, international norms and conduct when it comes down to, you know, international waters. Uh, yet our business communities continue to engage and basically fuel these two challengers that are disrupting the international order that has kept the peace and kept the freedom and been the basis for prosperity ever since World War II. That has to be addressed. Otherwise, we are severely handicapped in this competition. You know, on the question that you raised about Putin's, when you both raised on Putin's bad behavior, does, do you think that, pe that Putin believes he actually thinks he's fooling everybody and he has nothing to do with these cyber attacks, a bunch of private Russian hackers, and the poisoning of the Russian dissidents uh, you know, did not quite sure how that happened. I mean, most people, logical people sitting at home, see his fingerprints on it, but somehow there's a suspension of reality. Well, how, how, sh how should one view all this? If I could just take a shot. I, I think Putin is a pragmatist. I I'm more comfortable with someone like Putin in Moscow than, for example, someone like Khrushchev, mm -hmm. who's much more emotional, much more unpredictable, uh, you know, he, he driven by passion, whereas I, I think Putin is actually, you know, he's a strategist, he prepares for his actions, he probes and he acts when he sees there's, there's opportunity. He makes mistakes um, and, you know, that's human, so to speak, but he, he is predictable. And when there is a firm response to his aggression, he does back off. 
We saw that in Georgia uh, in 2008, when we flew back, we put at risk US C-5s to, float, to return uh, Georgian soldiers uh, to, to Belize. Uh, we saw that in Syria when they attacked the US outpost. We haven't that kind of aggression ever since in, 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 in Syria. So when there's, a fir- when there's a firm response, Putin calibrates his strategy. When there's a soft response, or the response infers hesitation, uh, if not disunity and intimidation, he drives forward. And that's when the risk of, of conflict with po- possibly dangerous escalatory dynamics becomes all the more real and all the more ominous. You were mentioning, um, Robert, there about sat- uh, is the cyber or satellite, is to talk about NATO, anti-satellite weaponry that is now being developed by both China and Russia. And these, these are aimed, I guess, at satellites that carry uh, fragile and all sorts of delicate information relating to communications, to banking, to navigation, other things. That's a whole new sector. How serious and how dangerous is the Russian and Chinese uh, investment in this area? I, cl- I saw that England's taking on 300 new scientists to deal with this. Robert? Well, before getting into that, I, I need to answer some of what... Uh, Ian is saying. Uh, yeah. The fact is, we and the Russians and the Chinese are going to have to live together. Yeah. We've got to come up with some rules of the road. Pushback is very important, but not just, and Biden indicated, uh, in fact, uh, uh, two, two important things. In fact, he did that to a great extent for the American domestic audience mm. to show that he's not going to be taken advantage of, like a lot of people, whether it's true or not argued was being done by Mr. Trump. A lot of that was uh, by the media and all that kind of stuff. We all understand it. So he said, for example, if Mr. Navalny dies in prison in Russia, there will be consequences. I won't tell you what they are. And that kind of puts uh, uh, Putin on notice. He doesn't want Navalny out there doing kinds of stuff and he's clamping down and none of us like it. Uh, All of us oppose it. But I think he now knows he better keep keep the guy alive. Uh, He also indicated with regard to cyber that the United States has capabilities, many of which the Russians know about, many they don't, and that if a lot of this stuff doesn't stop, uh, the Russians are in many respects more vulnerable uh, than we are. Uh, Similarly with regard to China, uh, and like it or not, we're going to have to find a way uh, in our own calculations, not in what we present publicly because Uh, We all know what's in the media and that sort of thing. Between those things that really matter to our interests, uh, uh, geostrategic interests, economic interests, and those things happening internally in other countries, we can push back. Uh, I think the genocide against the Uyghurs is a huge crime, one of the great crimes uh, of of, of modern times, and not the only one, but but, but one of them. And similarly, with regard to what happened uh, of regard to Russia, we tend to forget the uh, US and Western role in enabling, provoking, rationalizing for Putin things he did with regard to Ukraine. In 2008 in Bucharest, (laughs) I was there across the street uh, for uh, almost accidental reasons. NATO said, Ukraine and Georgia will join NATO. Well, they met in the sweet by and by. It was a way of pushing the issue off. But as I said instantly, that is the moment of commitment. That's what it means. Two people understood that. Saakashvili in Georgia, who then provoked the bear, and Putin, who was not then president, he was prime minister, but still running things, uh, understood that. Uh, And again, NATO in its latest communique repeated that. And as soon as I read that paragraph, I said, uh, Putin just broke out the champagne because that gives them an opportunity to go to Russia. See, the West is coming after us again. They're trying to encircle us. Well, it's not gonna happen. Uh, the, the phrase about Ukraine joining NATO then said, as through a process on the, the uh, membership action plan as usual, that is a code for us, which is way down the road, okay? But Putin uh, just uh, loved that. In 2014, the American Assistant Secretary for Europe uh, in effect, on a telephone call, was talking about running a coup d'etat in Kiev. Uh, 
How do we know? Because somebody, probably the Russians, released uh, the taped conversation. I always wonder about it because we spent a billion dollars on secure communications. What was she doing talking on an open line? Well, it came out. Everybody focused on a, a rude epithet towards the European Union, but the real guts of that was, we're gonna put our guy in power in Kiev. And Putin said, what the hell? That's a wonderful excuse for me to seize Crimea. And guess what? At, uh, uh, at uh, Geneva, when they went to five on five, sitting right across from uh, the uh, Russian uh, president, Putin, was the woman who did that in 2014, who now again has a senior job in government. That's, that's tone deaf. Okay, so we got to do these things, but we also have to work on the, okay, as Biden has said, you behave. If you don't behave, here's what I'm going to do. He's already got the, the back of the, uh, of the, uh, uh, what not be, of, the, of the allies, etc. But if you do behave, here's some things we can build on. Well, that's going to be a long game. He hasn't yet gotten to the point of figuring these things out with China, partly because, to be very blunt about it, since the end of the Cold War, we Americans and our think tanks and the like have not done a good job of genuine strategizing. We kind of intellectually uh, disarm, intellectually disarm, and we got to get back to that if we're going to be able to pull these together. Now on the satellite stuff. Incidentally, in the commercial area, uh, most uh, communication across the Atlantic Pacific goes onto the seas. It goes through fiber optics. Uh, the satellites are more for the military. And when it started, I, I said to myself at the time, you're going to pay a price by making the US military so dependent on vulnerable uh, internet connections. Big yep. mistake. And I think they're going to have to start figuring out uh, you don't want to go back to a semaphore, but you got to figure out a different way than being vulnerable. Ian, I'm sure you have a thought on that. I just add, I guess the Chinese have come up with something called the Dong Neng hit to kill interceptor, and the Russians have something called the PL-19 Nudol system. These are advanced systems. Is, is the West up we to- We have capacity too, you know. We yeah. have the capacity. So that was my question. So what is, is the United States up to speed to dealing with these things or have we been caught off balance somehow? Those are new systems. We're, de we're developing our own new technologies. They might not be, they might have different nuances compared to those. Like for example, we're not developing long range nuclear torpedoes that can go across the Atlantic like Putin says he is. So I'm not really worried so much about our technological edge. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, we have, it is more competitive than it was before. I'm mm -hmm. more worried about our willingness to actually exercise our power. Uh, and that's where, where, where I'm worried, and maybe that's where I, I dis, disagree with, with, with Robert. I don't think our, our responses, to, for example, in 2014 to Russia's invasion of Ukraine was adequate. Uh, I don't think that our response to Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific has been inadequate, I mean, has been adequate. I mean, that's demonstrated by the fact that the Chinese continue to move forward with, 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 with their pursuit of their, you know, their objectives. Putin is still in Ukraine. It's very clear he's ready and prepared when he feels the time is right to seize more Ukrainian territory. Um, he's operating in an aggressive way in the Arctic. Uh, so the problem hasn't gone away. And I, what I've actually seen from both China and Russia has been a steady escalation of aggressiveness and boldness in the provocations. I mean, you, you go back um, to 2014, you're talking about you know, a second seizure of territory followed by a swath of assassinations across Europe, of, you know, abrogation of arms control treaties, massive exercises, nothing that we've ever come close to, you know, scales of 100,000. Uh, for me, the, perhaps the most troubling was the unprecedented attack on a US outpost in Syria by, by Russia. That's the first r red on blue engagement I know of s since World War II, if there was any in, in, in World War, World War II. That's, pretty belligerent, and that reflects certain cockiness and, and, and aggressiveness that's not helpful. And no. we have not checked that. And the reason why we haven't checked that is because our responses to Russian aggressions have been really very, very targeted and limited in scope. Uh, our response to you know, the Russian aggression in Ukraine was four battalions that took three years to deploy uh, in, in Poland and three Baltic states. So that's you know roughly 4,000 people over three years to deploy in response to the violation of Ukrainian territory, the seizure of Ukrainian territory. 
among, among other aggressions. Our sanctions are, are not the full force of our economic power. They tend to be targeted against individuals and firms that actually don't do that much business with the United States. Look at the Navalny sanctions, uh, the most recent ones. They're basically against a bunch of prison guards. That doesn't signal resoluteness. And my fear is, is that that has actually emboldened Putin. I'm hopeful that what we've seen in the first six months of the Biden administration has been an effort to consolidate Western, you know, North Euro-Atlantic yeah. unity. Yeah. Uh, and then the next phase will be now a more assertive ex exercise of power, because that's the only thing that I unfortunately feel that Xi and, 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 and Putin respond to. With that said, I, you know, when I see someone like um, Robert, I'm always remembering what my father said, in addition to exercising force, always hand, have a hand of partnership so you can figure out where you can collaborate. Biden is doing that. He's consolidating the alliance. He's making up the right outreach for areas of collaboration. And he's signaling uh, that he's going to act. What I'm not certain about is how he's going to act. And, and you, that's the concern. You, do you attribute this to uh, Putin just trying to test the new administration, see where they stand? Same thing with the Chinese. And if that's what you think, do you think what the signals coming out of the Biden administration are sufficiently bold or, or assertive enough to tell them to take the foot off the pedal? If I could, I would say definitely Putin was testing. That's part of the mobilization in Ukraine. That's a ransomware attack, among other steps. That's his treatment of Navalny for that matter. Yeah. I'm not so sure that our response has yet been sufficiently robust. And I'm willing to give the new administration time because they had a difficult plate they inherited from the previous administration. Yeah. But at some time, he's gonna to have to push the European consensus more aggressively than he is right now. Robert, what do you think about that? Well, to begin with, let's look at, pick apart a few things. What happened in Syria? Uh, a lot of Americans don't know that in Syria, Russian and American military people talk to one another every single day to try to keep our militaries from, from uh, getting in trouble with one another. This was probably an accident in which somebody didn't get the memo. Uh, with regard to a lot of the other things, watch what Mr. Biden did when he was in Geneva. He uh, made very clear, obviously to, uh, uh, to Mr. Putin in a witnessed conversation, unlike Mr. Trump at Helsinki where there was nobody there as a witness, witness conversation than then what he said on television when he came out afterwards and said I told him this this and this and this uh, and uh, I suspect that uh, whatever Putin game Putin was playing and who knows it's probably in the mind of one man he now understands as I think uh, Ian was just saying he's got a president who's going to be alert to these things and if uh, stuff comes along he's going to respond in terms of what was done in Ukraine and it's being done in Ukraine now uh, we have to remember going back to uh, the Cold War in which we had a successful deterrence of Soviet actions against Berlin. Everybody knew they were, it was indefensible, but we had enough stuff there and enough backing and enough connectivity with allies and others to the rest of NATO and to the political and economic side that the Russians knew that grabbing West Berlin, which they could have done in, overnight, just was kind of stupid. And where we are now, I believe, uh, and this happened beginning under Obama, uh, under Trump, and now under Biden, is the Russians have to understand that the limits, the red lines have now been drawn in terms of things they can do. Now, we got to move out of the military, the, the military on the ground area, which is, uh, I think, uh, pretty, pretty stabilized now as long as we have the proper conversations. In terms of new nuclear weapons by Russia, who cares? We got nuclear submarines that you can't do anything about <laughs> with missiles on them. So I don't, I don't give a damn what kind of missiles the Russians have. Uh, it's not gonna give them advantage of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a of a chance to uh, catch something on us. But what Ian says, and I think he's absolutely right, we need to move the arms control matters out of uh, just nuclear weapons and the standard things were incidentally, the, bio, the withdrawal from arms control agreements was not run by the Russians, done by us. We quit the ABM treaty. We quit the uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. We quit the Open Skies Treaty, which frankly, I think Mr. Putin should 
which your body should just get back into. Uh, after all, everybody knows everything anyway. Uh, so let's, let's, let's get some of that stuff done. We need arms control, serious arms control, and it's gonna be very tough on outer space, on anti-satellite. We're gonna need serious arms control on the cyber, which is not just by governments, it's also by private individuals, where the Russians are going to have to start disciplining individual Russians who may be 16 years old, some of them, who knows, like uh, we have a lot of people here running ransomware who are just, you know, Americans without any foreign help. Uh, these are areas which we have to be very serious about before those get out of control or the chances of miscalculation moving from, let's say, uh, a cyber attack into something that's, which is kinetic and which could lead to real war. And a final point, we got to try not to get two new Cold Wars going. Because once you get there, you forget about how to talk to the other side. You just think you enable all the people who want to just build bad stuff, uh, nu nuclear and conventional military and, all, and the people who actually want to talk about how do you get out of this mess, uh, get shut up. They're not allowed to get in the print. They're not allowed to get on television. Uh, and then it be, it's up to Ian and me and people like that back of the barn to try to, or with our Russian and maybe Chinese counterparts and figure out how do we keep this from getting out of control uh, so we're all losers, all losers. Um, I think Boris Johnson shared your concern there. We can't afford to have two Cold Wars at the same time. A Cold War with China, I think is what he said. Ian, you were meant... Uh, Can I add something to that? Yeah, go ahead. A lot of people have learned that two front wars are stupid. Napoleon figured it out. Hitler figured it out. <laughs> In 1941, we didn't have a choice, but we prosecuted the war in Europe more intensively than the one in the Far East in order to get out of the way. We didn't have a two front war in the Cold War until Nixon went to China and peeled off China, which was ready to leave Russia anyway, and then got them more or less working with us against the Soviet Union, which helped bring the Cold War to an end. But right now, getting in a two front Cold War with Russia and China would be an amazingly, that would be diplomatic malpractice if we were not to get out of that. And we need to get out of it on a bipartisan basis because the foreigners don't give a damn which party's in power with the United States. They care about American power, American purpose, and American integrating all the elements of strategy and influence. Were we over, overly provocative, Robert, with the Chinese? Would you have had a more uh, diplomatic tone. Certainly, the, everybody came with the, someone with the guns blazing rather quickly with this particular NATO meeting. Would you have cautioned, given your feeling of dividing the world into two and avoiding two Cold Wars at the same time, to have taken a different public posture if you were in the Biden administration? Well, I've said already the biggest thing we have to do in all this is rebuild the American economy. And we also have to get at American cultural coherence to recreate a sense of bipartisanship. Uh, the kinds of things we've just seen in the last 48 hours here, that's not good for America and our capacity to have resolution, not just at home, but, but abroad. What I think you're talking about is that meeting in Anchorage, Alaska between an American delegation and a Chinese delegation. The Americans, I couldn't believe it, started out by lecturing the Chinese Instead of saying, welcome to Anchorage, we're going to talk privately and then we'll talk public. They lectured them for 16 and a half minutes. So the Chinese lectured us for 16 and a half minutes and that's all the media covered. I thought that was incredibly stupid as a way of starting. Now, Biden was smart when he went to, uh, uh, even though he said some public things before and when he got to Geneva, he didn't start by doing that publicly. He did what he had to do with Putin, witness conversation. Then he came out and he said, I told him all these things. You must not do this, must do that. Now, what do we work together? That was the way to do it. And he did it after Putin had spoken. They didn't have a joint press conference like that thing that happened in Helsinki, which was really a three-sided press conference where it was Trump and Putin on one side and the American media on the other side. And yeah. there was no way that that could have been a success. Ian, I wanted to pick up on uh, what you were saying earlier about American response being 
a little too timid. I was a little surprised when President Biden articulated 16 particular sectors of the economy that the Russians ought to keep their nose out of. If I were the 17th or 18th member of the U.S. Congress, I'd be a little nervous. Was that a bad idea? Yeah, I didn't like that. That left me uncomfortable. I, mean, I have to admit, I haven't looked at the list. But anytime you start boxing out where you can not fight and where you can fight, you're really inviting targeting and targeting of section 17, 18, 19, 20. And I'd love to know what was on that list uh, that goes beyond the 16. But let me address an important point. Can I add to that right away? Dean Atchison did that on Korea, left them yeah. out. We got a Korean war. Our, our representative Technology. in Iraq left out Kuwait and said we didn't care about it. We got an invasion of Kuwait. Yeah, he is exactly Good right. Point. Good you, point. Don't, you don't tell people, you keep them guessing. But the right. key, uh, big thing about, you know, can we handle a two front uh, challenge? Do we have a choice of whether or not we handle a two front challenge? I think, unfortunately, it's not our choice to make. Um, I personally think the problems we have today are, don't stem from American policy by and large, but really from the aspirations of the regimes that control China and, and Russia today. And they're causing that. I am optimistic that we can handle that if we marshal our resources and exercise our resources. You know, we have, what well, China's what, 17, 18 trillion dollars. That's the economy of the United States. That's also the economy of the EU, not to mention some of the countries outside the EU. Uh, and then you can, you can work in Japanese, Australian, South Korean economies. And you've actually got a balance of power that on the political, economic, and military side is very advantageous to, to the West or to Washington, however you want to define it. It's how we exercise it. My fear is, is that because we're not exercising that power robustly, we, are, we have regimes that are feeling increasingly emboldened. And that's why we're feeling more and more pressure on, 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 on both fronts. And the challenge is not going to be exercising our own power, but is convincing uh, our, particularly our European and our four most democratic partners in, in the Indo-Pacific to stand with us and quite frankly, undertake the economic sacrifices uh, that are going to come with the exercise of this power. And we clearly were unable to do that in the last four years. Uh, we didn't have a real effort to do that in the previous administration. Biden, I actually think, is somebody who can actually do that because he brings genuine commitment and he understands the geopolitics of it. But I'm a little bit worried over whether or not he will do that in light of some of the uh, reticent responses to some of the challenges he's faced, for example, in the run-up to the Geneva summit. But I'm willing to give him a, a little bit more time to consolidate that consensus within our transatlantic community, with, among our partners in, in, in the Indo-Pacific, over the next months to actually start exercising the power. But I am going to make a prediction that at some point, he's going to have to go beyond the existing consensus, particularly within the transatlantic community, if he's going to pull that consensus forward we really start clamping down on more severe economic sanctions, more robust military deployments, a more consistent political approach to these challenges, certainly in Europe, but also in the Indo-Pacific. Ian, do you think the uh, North Atlantic community is a bit reticent because they may see a one-term president here or they may see Donald Trump coming back in four years? Is there that factor looking behind? Oh, the factor is definitely there and they're, they're, they're explicit about it. Um, and as an American, I'm uh, maybe I'm a little bit more optimistic. Um, I am more confident than most that the Trump year was a flash in the pan. But when you have four years like that, it's not surprising you have a little bit of a hangover. Mm -hmm. But I will also say there is a certain strategic short-sightedness, short a certain kind of moral greed and a moral indifference uh, that comes in some European capitals when it comes to addressing the challenges posed by Russia when it comes down to the business opportunities they have and they pursue. And for that matter, with, with China, it is a it is a moral indifference. It is a strategic short sightedness um, that we in the United States also share. Well, Robert? I would look at it uh, more or less the same, but somewhat different. I think uh, Biden has made the following calculation: a two front war is stupid. We could fight a two front war if we had to. We did in. 1941 and 1945, but that's a kind of a waste of resources and you never know what will happen. If I had to compare the two countries we're talking about here, China and Russia, uh, Russia is a second-rate country still. It has certain tools that it uses 
uh, less military uh, uh, than in terms of cyber, in terms of getting our goat with uh, uh, what it's doing in, internally with uh, Mr. Navalny. Incidentally, I think Putin was absolutely right about something. He said Navalny came back in order to get arrested. Of course, that's why he went back. Okay, that, that works in the, in the West, but there you go, because we care about human rights, et cetera. And uh, you always have to figure out how you balance these things out, which is not easy because what's happening with the Uyghurs in China right now is big time. What's happening in Hong Kong is, is big time. So Putin, I think, uh, Biden, I think is saying, he's not said it, I'm going to try to stabilize the Russian front, give Putin a chance not to go in the Chinese direction, and then put the American effort to uh, the China thing. One of the advantages we have is that in Europe, we know what we're doing. Collectively, we know what we're doing. We have the forums. We have the experience. We've been doing it for 70 years. We know what we're doing. In the, uh, and we've got the, the red lines and all of that. Difficulty, not just with cyber and other things, is that there is a land frontier between Russia and the West. And there is a history of wars that have cost tens of millions of people in that particular place. So that's a different thing. In the Far East, the only land frontier we have is between uh, North and South Korea and maybe China and uh, some of the, uh, uh, the Southeast Asia countries, which are really rather second rate. And then the question about Taiwan. Uh, if China were going to go after Taiwan, that is an absolute for them and with us, a deal breaker. That is the thing that means a real Cold War. They have to understand that. We had, ever since Nixon went to China, we had a form of words that everybody could live with. And unfortunately, we've been drifting away from that form of words. We need to get back to it. Everybody will be willing to tolerate what it is. The big problem, there are a lot of big problems. One of them is in the Far East. We haven't figured out what do we really want, not what we want. What do we really need? What would we like to have? What is the order of priorities? What's the way of doing going about it? What countries do, do we work with? And what are their wants and needs? Uh, the four countries got together in the so-called quad. What did they talk about? Climate change. Climate change. Luca, I wanted to talk about Luca, can I just go to you? Uh, yeah. Do you have any questions there from the viewers? So I wanted to give uh, you gentlemen the heads up that we're about uh, three minutes away from the top of the hour. And also wanted to give uh, Senator Jim Rosepep the opportunity to ask a question because he did have a question, and um, I'm afraid that we're not going to have time for more than uh, more than that. But uh, Jim, no go ahead. Question. Can I say one thing? One yeah. good thing with Romania was we've sent extraordinarily fine ambassadors. Jim <laughs> well, on that note, we go and to Jim now Mark Wittenstein, who's going to be our um, one of the closest people to uh, to Biden, who's now going to be ambassador of the European Union. Romania, feel pleased. Excellent. Jim. Yeah, well, thank you. This is a very, very interesting discussion, and I appreciate uh, both of you guys uh, doing this. My question is, for all this conversation we had, what does this mean for Romania? What does it mean for the U.S. alliance with Romania? I think Romania is a robust uh, country involved with NATO, involved in the European Union, has come an extraordinary distance since it became the first country to join Partnership for Peace and join NATO back in 2004 and the European Union. Come a long way. It's dealt with a lot of corruption, a lot of other things. It hasn't gone the way of Hungary, or I'm sorry to say, it's gone the way of Poland. So I think that that is an evergreen relationship. And if I were Romania, I'd feel quite confident in my relationship with Western institutions and with the United States and with the United States. Yin? I'd second what Bob says, but also give a little bit, a little bit of concern. One, you know, my first real exposure with the Romanian military was back in 2004 when I visited Afghanistan and visited the Romanian detachment out there. And it was really, really impressive. And that is an experience that's kind of seared in my mind. And it, to me, it, it, it emblem, it's emblematic of the strength of the bilateral relationship. I agree completely with, with Robert and you know, how far Romania has come and important leadership role it's playing in, 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 in Central Eastern Europe and in Europe. I work a lot on an initiative called the Three Seas Initiative, which is to accelerate regional cross-border uh, infrastructure, roads, highways, pipelines, and that sort of thing. Romania has been a true leader in that. Uh, so it's, it's really impressive. 
But to get specific about this summit, what it meant for, 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 for Romania, I would say on the positive, anything that underscores uh, you know, renewed, reanimated, revitalized, strengthened American commitment uh, to European security is good for Romania. Uh, second, that occurs in a context when the Alliance and the United States, Washington in particular, has been focusing more and more on, the, on Black Sea security. For the last several years, the real focus has been on the kind of the, the Baltic Sea region as a zone of competition, confrontation with Russia. More recently, there's been a shift in focus where they're now beginning to address, and you can see this through deployments. Robert mentioned one of them that occurred just before the summit in terms of an exercise in the Black Sea region. So that will continue to be a, a, a growth of concern. I'm not convinced that um, this summit, this NATO summit, our focus, was a real catalyst in terms of more activity. Because uh, the Black Sea didn't get as much focused, the Black Sea region didn't get as much focused attention I thought it, it deserved in that summit, summit communique. Nonetheless, my sense is that within the Biden administration, you have a recognition that this increased attention in the Black Sea region is something that merits to be continued. And I would expect deeper engagement between the United States and Romania as, as part of that. Certainly, I in agree the with all that. Let me add one word. Uh, Romania has, in virtue of Joanna, the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. And that is not, uh, that, that's not just green beans, that's something real. Well, on that point, that's a nice, it's nice to remind us that we have Mircea Joana, Romania's Mircea Joana is right in the middle of Brussels. And I guess we are expecting a new uh, NATO general head coming up at some point. So we'll see which way that takes us. I want to thank you both for an interesting conversation, particularly although you're more or less on the same side of many issues, you have some sharp disagreements there, which was interesting to get out there. And uh, I thank you both for your time. It's a terrific discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Uh, Jim, thanks for hosting this. Robert, Ambassador Hunter, always good to see from you. Always good to learn from you. American, I always learn from you. American foreign policy has fundamentally to be bipartisan in order to work. Yep. And if Ian could get in this administration, I would feel a lot happier, even <laughs> than I am now. Okay, over to you, Ian. All right, thank you very much.